and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to... The madman behind the various forms of Mecha versus Ka versus Kaiju, now ret now returning with a with a re with a new version of one of his uh, one of his other settings, Shen Battler Aurora, using hit using his um, fifth engine, the one and only the Mister Wright of <laughs> ta of tabletop, Jonathan Wright. How are you doing today, man? How's it going? It's going. I'm pretty sure you've heard the Mr. Right jokes. I'm pretty sure I did it the last time I had you on, but I can't resist. Every single one of them, in fact. I've um, you know, grow, you know, growing up in the uh, you know in the '70s and the '80s. Yeah, it was uh, it was uh, it, it, it was a dark time. Yeah. Anybody, you know, any, anybody who's sort of you know like you know different, uh, you know, understands. You know, all the gamer nerds. Yeah, it's uh, just part of the course. I think so I, they turned me back. Yeah, I think I, I think I lucked out when it came to when it came to that whole thing because kind kind of hard kind of hard to bully the guy who's um taller than everybody else. That and the whole finding new and interesting ways to get back at people. Yeah, uh, definitely being um you know uh you know being physically fit is uh is a plus. If you can't fight, being able to run that was that was my particular specialty. Oh. Nobody could catch me. Well, some sometimes sometimes they'd get their licks in, and I I'd always give a warning. You're get I'm get, I'm gonna get you for this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> especially when the when one of the people in the for the for say the football team was foolish enough to leave the to leave his trunk unlocked. Oh January, yeah, like. In January in the Midwest, so I gave him a I gave him a little gift of leaving twenty four cans of Pepsi in his trunk. And uh, below freezing overnight, that would make for a very interesting uh, fizzy experience in the morning. Well, a couple of days later, I, I said I said you should you should I hear I hear they're opening slushies I hear they're opening up slushies at the B, at the BP nearby here. You should try some. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> because it's not worth getting back at them if they don't know it was you. Well, the well, the best part is when they know it's you and they can't do anything about it. Right. Oh, uh, because all, all that I said was just was just was just about slushies. And what? It, 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 I'm just talking about like you know a snack food. I don't see why uh, you get upset about that. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh. There was also the the whole thing of of um screw of screwing up screwing up the senior prom by finding where they put the votes and rigging them so they kept tying for about three months. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Well, that 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 and um, there was always a special bowl that the prom king had had drank from. Um, I had I had um. I had I had added a little I had added a little something extra to that one. Um, nothing dangerous. It was just cinnamon. Just enough to like you know make that uh, first picture very interesting. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. My uh, my my high school experience was uh, uh, was uh, not that interesting. I was pretty much a uh, a hardcore nerd. Um, you know, I was, I was doing, um, uh, I was doing gaming as a, as an early teen. Mm -hmm. Um, my brother actually gave me the first, uh, my first, um, D and D books. Mm -hmm. He was in the Navy and he got stationed elsewhere. So the person that he played with, he wasn't playing with anymore. And like, he wanted to travel light. So, uh, I inherited like a whole mess of AD and D stuff. And, um, Reading that without any context for gaming was really interesting. 
So I really wasn't entirely sure what it was all about until um, a couple of good friends, um, I was in uh, in their games, and then it was just like the floodgates opened. Mm-hmm. Um, I had... If I have to blame anything for me getting into getting into stuff like D anD D, it is the the old choose your own adventure books. I was looking for more of that, and I ended up coming across D anD D by accident. Well, th- well, by accident and give and being given some of the some of the um black books. Uh, nice, some of the classics. Yeah, when I when I got into college and I started, um, uh. Well, actually, what happened was um, I was working at Sears of all places, and I found twenty bucks on the floor, and this was just as they were releasing second edition. Hmm. And I'd been playing AD and D with my friends, and they had been running. I decided, you know what, I'm going to start running games, and so, um, so I I spent this twenty bucks on the. Uh, second edition player's handbook and started running and found some of like the old classic Ardwin books and uh, and stuff like that and decided oh man this stuff is crazy I have to use this and so I I, I started like um, incorporating a lot of the the uh, the indie gaming stuff into my D and D game which strangely enough is what I actually ended up doing for the fifth engine. Because like the the whole idea for that was to have like a um uh, a fifth edition sort of like like underpinning, so it was all interconnected with everything else that um you know that's out there, but would play like an indie game. So I hadn't even thought about that, but I I've, I've been kind of like building up to this for a lot longer than I thought I was. Yeah, that tends to be the process now. Shen Battler Aurora, I believe or, you had originally developed at at least at least as far as I'm aware, was developed it, as a fate um, setting. Yeah, it, it, it was a, it was a setting book for the um, the Fate Core Mecha versus Kaiju game. is actually the last um, the last book published for um, for Fate Core, mm-hmm. and um, uh, I was really happy with it. It was it, it was inspired by um, Japanese isekai anime and manga. Uh, isekai is Japanese for other world. Mm-hmm. I'm, and I'm the, very familiar with isekai. Oh yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the um, yeah, I mean, obviously, like or or, uh, or Battler Dunbine was was a was a big inspiration, um, along with um, uh, Escaflown and um, uh, uh, Magic Knight Rayoth. Um, you know, uh, what about five those... star stories? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that uh, that one. Um, I I think um, I think my vision of the Shen Battlers, which is the name for the uh, for the Mecha, is closer to Or Battler Dunbine, just because it's it it's a lot more kind of. I like the idea of almost like um, uh, artisanal Mecha, right? Like you know, like one or maybe two people working together. You know, slowly you know, like casting and crafting uh like you know um spend like they, they take a week and like okay here's an arm right and they get that down and so it's like you know it, it i i think my vision is that you know for this system is that they're smaller than the five star story games which were just these gothic monsters and incredibly beautiful mm-hmm. um but um uh I think I, I think the vision of Shen Battler is that it is, you know, the Shen Battlers are something that, um, you know, like a uh, uh, a crafting character could, over the course of like you know many many sessions, actually build for themselves. Um, you know, uh, uh, almost like you know, like on their own, or maybe like you know, uh, uh, an adventuring party slowly constructing this thing. Uh, together, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and yeah, the five star stories mecha, while incredibly beautiful, are like way too big for that kind of setting. Yeah, I, I get the feeling. You're, I get the feeling. The way you describe these Shen battlers, they're probably around like twenty five feet or twenty seventeen to twenty five feet, the size of Grandpa yes. Gundam. 
Yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. At, at, at largest, yeah. The um, uh, you know uh, another um, a good example of, of that would be um, uh, like you know the scope dogs. Mm -hmm. um, those would be um, you know, about the, the the scale that I'm looking at. Um, in part because like unlike um, unlike in Mecha versus Kaiju, where like there's just a complete separation between fighting in a mecha and fighting in like sort of human scale i really wanted the shen battlers to be something that would like dominate the battlefield but could still you know we're still sort of human scale mm -hmm. so like you know one shen battler would be a challenge for like an adventuring party but eventually like each one of them could like you know, uh, uh, get a get a Shen battler and um, you know, and be able to take on like you know an army on their own or something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, given that th given that this is using the fifth engine, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, we we talked about it the last the last time I had you on, and the fifth engine is in is. At, at the time I had just, at the time I had understood it as a combination of elements between D and D fifth edition and fate in particular fate's aspect system yeah so yeah we definitely kept that one of the things I'd, I'd want to ask because this is because I do remember that this is something I was critical of when it came to the aspect system and I brought it up with you is um, guidance you know there's with some with with some material, with some materials, there's not a whole lot of guidance as far as good, as far as good or bad aspects, or even just examples of aspects in some cases. Uh, with with your equivalent of the aspect system that's in the fifth engine, is that something that you plan on ad addressing and giving, some, even if this is just a zine, giving some example um, aspects or its equivalent? Uh, the um, uh, our um the 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 zine release uh is a complete um role playing system so it has the complete rule set complete character creation uh it does the only difference um is it it has a uh, a more streamlined uh, uh mecha creation and power creation system uh it's more um uh, it's more um, kind of aspect based, and then like a dice benefit of some kind. Maybe like add a d6 to your roll when you do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but other than that, the uh, Shen Battler Aurora is the complete fifth engine system. Um, so uh, re uh, regarding aspects, um, we have a lot of guidance in the um, uh, in the core rules about. Um, examples for the, um, the, the the different aspects. So personality um, is is kind of what you show on the outside. So that could be um, it could be a catchphrase like you know I've got a bad feeling about this. You know that um, uh, you know that's a that, that's a classic one. Um, it could also be uh, sort of like how you show what's going on on the inside. Things like you know carrying the weight of the world. Um, you, know, we, you know, we've all seen people that, like, you know, have this really, like, th their sense of responsibility is something you can feel about them. Uh, they, don't, they don't have to tell you that that's something. Um, and then um, uh, sometimes in the way that they behave, like, unshakable optimist. So, um, I, so I've got um, uh, a whole list of, like, you know, over a dozen of uh, sample personality aspects Um and then the um, uh, the same with identity. Um, now, identity is kind of a two-parter because part of your identity is based on your archetype. So, a tremendous amount of what the character creation involves is deals with the archetype mm -hmm. because your chosen archetype um, you know, does a lot of the heavy lifting as far as character is concerned. Um, so you know if, if 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 you're playing a uh, if you're playing a yusha the hero then you know you you know you're heroic uh, and the power that comes with that um, you basically involves people believing that you're a hero 
Like that's that's just like part of your character. Um, where at the other extreme, literally, because at the other end of the alphabet, the baka is the fool, and the um, the fool is just that. That's you know, y- you are the person who's going to trip over the uh, uh, you know uh, who's going to trip over the stool and fall flat on their face, and everybody's going to laugh because you're the fool. You get the advantage of people um, underestimating you. So, um, and if you're the hero, you get the advantage of people respecting you and recognizing your heroism. Mm-hmm. Now, now maybe if somebody has a negative attitude about that heroic incident, that might <laughs> that might come into play as well. But um, you know, those parts of the character are true, and. And that's the thing I really like about aspects as well. Um, aspects are true. So if you say that you, and this is something we got from Fate. Um, classic example there was just like, if you say you are the best swordsman in the kingdom, that's true. And, you know, there might be people who will challenge you. You might be able to use that um, that aspect to... Um, uh, to do better in combat, or to try and intimidate somebody. So the fact that you're the best swordsman in the kingdom, uh, you can decide how that gets used in a scene. And of course, the game maker gets to take that idea and use that um, when they are uh, deciding on encounters. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, obviously, given this hybrid... Oh. Mm-hmm. I want to I want to shift into the magic system since because of, in part because of the kind of setting that you're going with and the inspirations that you're going with obviously a magic system in the way a lot of people think magic systems are supposed to work would not be applicable. Oh. So Absolutely. How, how are you, so when it comes to when it comes to magic, as far as the nitty gritty, the spell casting, the throwing the fireballs and all of that jazz, um, how does it how work? Are you having that work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the um, uh, so in in Mecha versus Kaiju, uh, you can craft a magic system that basically works the way you want it to. And in fact, um, uh, I've got two different campaigns. Um, with two very different magic systems. Um, so, you know, you can have a lot of variety in, like, the core game. Specifically for Shen Battler, um, as, you know, as is, is you know, as is pro- uh, uh, proper for, um, you know, for a role-playing game, the magic system grows organically out of the setting. So, a little quick history for um, the planet of Materia. Uh, it used to be connected to the source of life. Uh, life force is called Shen. This is an idea that I got from, uh, from uh, Chinese mythology. Shen is the life force, and it animates things. So one of the reasons, like philosophically, the Chinese never um, did a whole lot with their scientific knowledge or technology that they had was that their concept of the universe was that like it, you know in order to understand something you know it had to have shen and so like objects didn't really have shen so it was hard to um uh, examine them uh and that's a gross mis- you know um uh, uh you know simplification but um you know it basically explains you know the the, the core idea so on materia shen is real and because the world was tied to the source of Shen, the source of, of life force. Um, uh, it, it was it was thriving. There was a bridge, a physical bridge between the world of materia and the source of life, and that was also where all the light came from. It's this glowing bridge that um, uh, ended at this um, this plateau and cast light across the whole planet. Um, this race of um, sorcerers arose, and um, they called themselves the Grey Art. They're the Sorcerer Kings, and they figured out how to use Shen and craft it into magic. Mm-hmm. And essentially, what they would do is they would they would grab Shen and they would 
tinker with it and then make it do what they wanted. Mm -hmm. That's the essence of the magic system in Shen Battler Aurora. Uh, as an action, you gather Shen. Uh, you can pull it out of yourself or you can pull it out of um, uh, some other source. Um, the amount of Shen you can pull safely is um, fairly low. So you can either absorb it over, you know, slowly over a long period of time, or you can basically steal it from another source. Um, and this is what the Sorcerer Kings started doing. The Grey Ark would um, uh, start basically pulling from the ground, and magic would flow in these dragon lines, kind of like the, the, the you know the classic European mythology. And um, literal dragons would live on this, and that would be, you know, how, how they would survive. Um, when the um, when the Grey Ark started basically hoarding Shen, the dragon lines weakened, the world started to sicken, and the idea of blight came about. That's if you can remove all the Shen from an area, uh, it becomes blighted. And you can also blight people. If you take too much Shen from yourself, it affects you as um as physical stress and um uh you know if you're particularly diabolical you can take chen from other people although obviously that's frowned upon in most in most uh, uh civilizations um so um uh so that kind of like explains the sort of philosophy of spell casting mechanically um you take an action to gather shen and and it, it's literally an action. Uh, you use the same rules you would use for creating a boon, and you're you're literally creating a magical boon. Um, depending on how powerful that is, you are able to craft um, spells that have um, various numbers of perks, which are basically dice benefits. Uh, in a specific situation. So, add a d6 when you're doing this. Um, add plus two uh, impact uh, when you cast this. Uh, so, it, so the components are all, um, you know, kind of like little Lego pieces. And then you just add labels, add um, aspects to them to explain how it all works together. If you're familiar and comfortable with the system, the goal is to get, reach the point where people can literally freeform their spells. You know, and that's one of the reasons why in Shen Battler, um, I'm, I'm I'm basically reducing the number of perks. I really want it to be a, a very um, simple, streamlined system. So there's maybe only like four or five um, benefits, like you know, mechanical benefits, but then everything else is the flavor that you throw on. So, you know, people can literally just at the table, um, uh, yeah, you know, freeform spells on the fly. Um, so, uh, uh, for example, let's say you um, uh, you take an action, you create a uh, Shen Boon. Let's say um, you get a D six. Uh, so boons function basically as dice bonuses, and you can uh, add one boon to any dice pool. So, let's say you make a D6. That would allow you to create a spell that has one perk or two perks if you also give it a drawback. And drawbacks are like rule-based penalties. Like, you know, you maybe you have to take a point of stress when you cast the spell, or you can only use it in a very specific situation. Um, uh, you know, or maybe it like, you know, benefits your enemies in some way while you're casting the spell. Any one of those things could be a drawback. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when you, ha you ha so you have your boon that you create, and then you can create, you can uh, craft a spell. Um, and the higher the Shen boon you've created, the the more powerful the spell is. Um, so, like at the table live, you could take an action to um, uh, to gather Shen create a, a, a magic boon for yourself, and then in the following round, 
cast the spell of your choice. What you know, whatever kind of spell you want to um, craft using that magical power. And in the scene, as long as you have that Shen boon, you can keep casting that spell. And that's something that um, anybody at a low level can do. Um, if you want to cast like higher level spells, you need like a magical specialty, which would be like um, like a talent that would allow you to cast more powerful magic in a particular way. And that's where you get your magic schools, like enchantment or um, uh, uh, or necromancy or things like that. Mm -hmm. And this does br this does bring in s something interesting that I think a lot of people end up overlooking. Whenever you're dealing with a with media that's inspired by work by fiction in in East Asia in general and in this case Japan, that that line but that martial magical line that so many people <laughs> assume in fantasy is non-existent. Yeah, like in a in a throwing a a character who throws around fireballs or light or lightning is who would be a mage in a in a typical in a in a what's and what's referred to as a generic fantasy setting even though i hate that yeah term, but that's another story. oh yeah I, I, but yeah it's a, oh, sometimes it comes that to would me just be that would just be seen as another form of gung fu right and i mean like you know if you have um well i mean like you know uh luffy in one piece like you know is his uh, um, uh, is his stretching a uh, a melee or a ranged attack? You know, how do you want to flavor it? Uh, you know, the um, uh, you know, I, like in in um, in Shen Battler, it would just be like you know, you would just like he would have a talent that he can make melee attacks at range, and you know, it would literally be just that simple. Um, and obviously, all of the other elements, you know, that come with his, uh, you know. <laughs> Come with his, uh, uh, you know, his crazy abilities uh, could be um, represented in the same way. But like, you know, is that magic? Is it physical? Does it really matter? I mean, that's all really a question of the fiction of the game. And one of the things I really love about um, sort of narrative games is it really is sort of a fiction first situation. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to make sure that we had sort of like these these narrative tools that were um, hardwired into the game. Um, one of the things I've been um, talking to people about it's the question that I always get, and I'm just you know I'm I'm throwing it out here because I'm betting you have listeners that are asking this question: Why five E? Why even bother with that? And. Um, Anybody, you know, who would, anybody who would ask that yeah. in my temple would you? I would usually tell them, "This isn't Five E. This is the fifth engine." <laughs> exactly. But the thing is, but it, it is, um, uh, you know, it, it is like you know, uh, there is a core of Five E. Like you know, if you if you look at the spine of this thing, um, you know, it's built on, um, you know, it's built on s uh, certain core mechanics. And um, the reason for that, for one, is I'm a grognard. I've been playing D and D since uh, since the 1980s. I love it. I played every single system, and I've enjoyed every single system. And yes, even fourth edition. Hey, so, I we like fourth edition in my temple. So hey, no, all right, no shame, no shame here. I've 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 made almost a career of ta of taking pot shots at people who do not who um make it very clear with the way they speak that they only know the straw man idea of fourth edition instead of what we ah. have in the books. Yeah. Um, like that whole, I, I, that whole, I, I... that whole, um, f um, that whole MMO argument that I keep hearing. Um, I think a lot of people who may, whenever I say, okay, is okay. Is it, is it a sandbox style MMO that is, that is trying to be like, or is it a theme park style MMO? And then they look at me like I got flaming turds hanging out of my mouth. Exactly right. Yeah, and and, and yeah, I mean, you know, they, they just don't like you know, sort of like the uh, like like the buzzword arguments and 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 nothing further. And a lot of them were just like you know, they'll make the argument, and they'll just take like you know, well, what did you think when you played it? I never played it. It's like okay, yeah, now I now no, I know where nobody to t nobody your... tells them that people were saying that third edition was turning D and D into Diablo. That was 
that was it. That was part of the discourse around that around that time okay. in the early two thousands. To be fair, um, to be fair, uh, TSR did release a Diablo game using the third edition rules. So, I mean, they also did one for A D and D. So they re- <laughs> they released multiple. Um, yeah, yeah, they they you know, did. They were kind of asking for that <laughs> for eight for A D and D. It's it's one of the, it's. I I I bring that kind of thing up because it's one of those um, things that people can decided to gaslight their their way into, kind of like how um Why? in in the aftermath of the Schumacher Batman movies, there was this narrative that showed up that was basically arguing that Batman was was always was always dark and serious and gritty until until Schumacher came along and mucked it up. Nobody told really? him about the Silver Age. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, uh, Bat- Batman 60, 67? No? Okay, fair enough. Um, you which, know, carry on. It's Yeah, it's one of... Obvious, obviously, I'm taking the piss, but it's one of those things that seem... That, um... Once you actually, once you actually sit... Once you actually sit down and, and dedicate one brain cell to the, to the claim, it doesn't hold a whole lot of weight. Right. And as as much as as much as people will, br- I know people will bring up the the um the the Adam West Batman TV show with that. I will go one step further and bring up the entirety of the Silver Age of comics, where I don't know if drugs were involved in the writing process, but if they were, I would nod and say that makes sense. <laughs> No, I, I I totally get and and the the I, you know getting a little far afield here, but the, I mean you can look at the entirety of Grant Morrison's run with Batman and see just like how wildly creative the Silver Age was. Like you know they didn't give a damn about anything. Send Batman to an alien planet. It, yes, let's do that. That is awesome. Next week, he is fighting in a candy factory. There is no logic to any of this, and um, it, it was just like it was just raw imagination and desperation, right? Because they needed to, they needed to reach deadlines, and so they just didn't care. I'd say um, I'd, I'd not to get too fine a point on it, but I'd say a lot of it was. Um, oh, was overcorrecting due to Frank Wortham's infamous book that got way oh, yeah, more absolutely. traction than it deserved. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, like you, you know, yeah. You, you, you couldn't have you couldn't have Batman like you know, um, like he's doing it, just going into a dark alley and like punching thugs, right? Like you know, for one, you can't even show you know <laughs> show him punching anybody to start with, right? So I mean, yeah, it, uh, it it was pretty ridiculous, definitely. Yeah, but um, it's that's just that's just one of those um one of those things that I f- that I feel should be it should be called out since a since a lot of people um when I think I think Wick said it best about how we how we cast things in a romantic light and all husbands know shadows mm. do a great job of hiding love handles. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. Now since we're dealing with mechs and since you brought up the idea of of mech creation being it being its own arc unto unto itself. Mm. Um, given the fiction first design, I'm guessing you're not doing what some what some mech games do and ha- and have different um par- different parts be their own little section. Um, like the head is its own section, body is its own section, that kind of thing. I get the feeling you're not, not doing that. Not in this setting. No, the, uh, this this setting is very much kind of like um, it's almost like building a golem, really. Uh, so you like you know you're um, you you would have to sort of like. Um, craft the individual pieces uh but it's not like you know like i don't form the head it's not it's nothing like that it's made it's mainly like just like like making a big suit of armor um so uh and the rules for it are fairly basic i mean when you get right down to it you're just spending xp for the different components Mm -hmm. uh and it's going to be aspect based um 
kind of like the classic uh, mecha versus kaiju uh, fate version. You could have aspect based mecha, or you could add special abilities to them. So, for example, your wave motion gun could just be an aspect, or um, it could actually have like rules connected to it. And that's a choice that uh, you know the, that the um, uh, the players in the GM can make. So, you know, there, 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 there's options for, you know, like point by abilities, or you can just like, you know, craft them as aspects. And those aspects give you narrative permission to do stuff. Mm. So like, you know, if it has, um, you know, uh, angel wings, okay, you have angel wings, and that means you can fly. And, you know, what does that look like? Well, it depends on how gritty you want to get to it you know like if you want to have movement rules then have people spend um their xp on getting levels of movement so like you know okay you can um at, you know like, like uh, you can easily move to like a far away location which is one of my ranges we basically have like you know uh close which is martial uh nearby which means you can get to them easily and still take an action far away is anything that they're still in the same scene but they're a distance away mm. and then that distance becomes either a, a, a boon or a condition depending on whether you're hiding from somebody or trying to shoot them you know is it easy you know, is your action easier or harder because you're farther away uh so it is not you know, you know I, th this is very much a theater of the imagination situation and um things like distance are you know are just are covered as um uh sort of like modifiers basically um so you could get really sort of nitty-gritty like okay i'm gonna uh you know your mecha with the angel wings is going to buy like you know two levels of movement so they can get like i don't know like a like you know they can get, get like a scream and get a d10 uh, distance away. It's just incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. Or you could just say, you've got angel wings, I'm going to spend a point of inspiration and I can fly for the scene. And, you know, that's all it takes. It really depends on, um, you know, like, uh, on sort of like um, uh, uh, how um, how crunchy the, uh, the, the, the game group wants to get. Mm -hmm. And Yep. With that now, with that in mind, you you've talked about you've you've talked you've talked on the um, page about it being compatible with it with Five E Adventures and source books. So I'm curious. I'm curious if you plan on putting a section that is that is meant to be kind of a conversion guide for people who want to bring some of their stuff over from Five E into the Fifth Engine. Absolutely. It is actually shockingly simple to uh, run any 5e game uh, using the fifth engine. And again, that's one of the reasons why I sort of like hardwired five, you know, like, like you know, like incorporated 5e's D, uh, DNA into the, the game design. I wanted that. Um, so the easiest way to describe the fifth engine is to imagine your favorite 5e character but replace every one of the static bonuses with a die so rather than having like a plus four strength they would have a d8 rather than having um you know using like a short sword they would you know have a d6 um are they sort of new to all of this, you know, uh, fighting and stuff? Maybe their proficiency bonus is only a D4. And when you are deciding what you're going to do, when you're taking an action, you call out your traits. And this, for me, is really um, one of the most important parts of the system. In 5e and other sort of D20-based games, you can very easy fall into a pattern of, oh, it's my turn? Okay, um, uh, roll, add the bonus, hit, here's my damage, next. 
and it really sort of gets repetitive. So the fifth engine is really created to reward creativity and to set up a system of rules where the GM doesn't have to keep making all of these ad hoc rulings. If somebody wants to slide down a banister while they're shooting a machine gun and at the same time try and spot somebody who is getting away um, you know, at the other side of the building, then you can do that. You know, you can you know, like call out your trades. Okay, I'm going to use my super spy identity. That's a D6. This is a bold action. I'm uh, so I, that's going to be a D8. I am all alone in this. So I'm using my self reliance. That's going to be another D8. I've got my machine gun. So um, that's going to add a D6. All right, I take all those dice. Uh, I add my D20 fortune die and I roll them all together. And you take the two highest dice and you add those together and that becomes your action total. And then for every one of those dice that you roll, any of them that get a four or higher gives you a point of impact. And impact is basically the currency for actions. Mm -hmm. So you want to cause a point of stress, that's a point, spend a point of impact. You want to give yourself a boon Spend a point of impact, you get a D4. Spend another point of impact, you get a D6. And they just step up that way. You want to put a condition on somebody. Maybe you want to trip them while you're taking an action. Um, if you rolled against them, and they were the one that were trying to counter your action, you, if you're successful, you can put a D6 condition on them. Trip them up or um, uh, you know, make them unstable or something like that. Um, so... The amount of actions you can take is based on the level of your success. Um, and then um, it's up to you to narrate what you do. And um, and that's the thing that really makes it unique. Um, the, the, the things I've heard from the people who play test to the game are, you know, it's, it, it's a really unique way of sort of showing the actions that are uh, that are happening and and, gi and giving the players the freedom to come up with these ideas the gm is not involved in any of that right the gm is not making any sort of like they're not setting a dc for sliding down the banister they're not figuring out the uh, the, uh, the armor class of the people that they're shooting um they're not figuring out like you know uh, a range penalty so for you know, to see how far it's going to none of that is a concern. Uh, it's all based on the um, the narration of the character. So it's a very fiction first sort of system that keeps things moving, makes it very free form. And you know, as a GM myself, <laughs> running games for years and years, it is so easy to run. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind. One of the one of the things that I've I've argued for years that um, five five e and its and even its predecessors have needed and something that I could see being a bit easier to do in this is some form of monster creation because you can make you can make mm -hmm. the biggest damn uh, monster manual or volumes of monster manual as as you want but eventually you're gonna run out right never mind the fact that there's maybe maybe sit maybe. Despite all the monsters in, say, the Monster Manual of Pick an Edition, <laughs> even <laughs> even the even the Monster Book and White Box, if you're so inclined, how many of those are you actually using in a in a given session or even a given campaign? Right. Or yeah. And I I know some people will say, "Oh, just house rule the ones that are that exist." That's not that that's a bandage, not a fix. Right. Yeah, I mean, like the uh, uh, reskinning, uh, you know, has has been like you know a, a tried and true um, 
uh, tradition for uh, for years and years. But yeah, creating new um, uh, new monsters is um, I mean it's a joy for one thing. I mean like you know you're you're unleashing something. That was one of the best things about reading uh, Dragon Magazine back in the day. It was just finding these weird monsters that they were uh, you know dropping and then like you know they show up next week in your game and, and your players are like what the hell is this thing so how, you know giving people the freedom to do that is really important to me um so um uh, you you had asked about um converting existing adventures and uh, kind of um got into just the general system but monster creation is related to that um so any 5e stat block you can use um, in the fifth engine without a problem. Um, the core system um, handles like CR one quarter to about CR three or four, just with its sort of um, default NPC system. And um, uh, so if you want to make an, uh, an NPC, you want to make a monster in the fifth engine it's really easy you give the monster an aspect that uh, aspect has a die and that's really all you need to sort of have a basic npc um a lot of the heavy lifting is done with what's called the danger dice um and i know I'm, i i i talked about these in uh uh last time mm -hmm. um but the danger dice represent the level of peril in the scene and they are a, a dice pool that counters every action that the player characters are taking in, in, in one way or another. So um, typical peril would be uh, 3d6. So the player, our super spy in the previous um, example, is rolling uh, 2d8 and 2d6 plus a d20 fortune die. So they roll theirs, they get their action total and their impact, then that roll is countered by the danger dice. Now, if all they have to do is just slide down the banister and keep their balance, that's just straight up danger dice. So roll 3d6 plus a d20, compare the um, uh, action total with the counter total. You know, If the action total is higher, they succeed. Um, by the way, if their action total does not succeed, they do still generate a point of impact. Unless the fortune, unless the fortune die rolled uh, less than a four, they always generate one point of impact because I hate a round where the players do nothing. It is a wasted opportunity. It's no fun for them. It's no fun for the GM. No fun for anybody. So. Players should be competent. They should have a minimum level of competency. So they always generate at least one point of impact. Um, so um, if you have an NPC in that situation, let's say he, uh, the super spy is shooting at a guard, then you give them an aspect. Like um, it could be like, you know, um, uh, could be like hapless dupe. They might have a D4 aspect. And so you add that D4 to the danger dice. So danger dice 3D6. Hapless dupe D4, you roll all those dice together with the fortune die. Mm -hmm. If they are better trained guards, the die is going to be higher. As you get higher NPCs, they may get special abilities. Easiest one would be like equipment. Right? So like, you know, if it's, um, you know, if it's an armed guard, maybe they have like a D6 for their aspect and like a D4 for a pistol. Mm -hmm. uh, where if it's just like you know a mercenary, like a like you know like, like a trained mercenary, maybe he's got like a uh, a D8 aspect and D6 uh, equipment, and there it would just be like you know mercenary equipment. He's going to have armor, he's going to have weapons. So any pretty much any time he's fighting, you're going to throw an extra D6 into the lot. Mm -hmm. um, and those are those are basic powers, really. So like you know adding the D6 to like you know attack and defense, that's a power. And whether it's a mercenary with a gun or a manticore with their poison bite is really just a question of, um, of degrees. And so creating monsters becomes really easy. And most importantly for the, for the game master, it's something you can do on the fly. So, you know, uh, you, you, could, you, uh, you could base those decisions on just like your own... 
Um, but mainly in, in Shen Battler, you're basing those those decisions on kind of like your own interpretation of the danger in the situation. So and, and how talented or how dangerous the the enemy or the monster is. Um, so we don't go into a whole lot of detail in Shen Battler about um, uh, you know how to make those decisions. You're basically adding one die. It's kind of a sliding scale of, of, of ability. Um, and then uh, maybe one additional die for a power. Um, so maybe it's just like, you know, a poison attack or fire breath or something like that. Um, there are some other changes. For example, you can, you can cause stress or you can cause conditions. You can like automatically cause conditions as part of an attack. Fire breath, for example, you can say like, okay, you know, throw an extra D6 and when they take damage and when they take stress, they also take like one half the level of stress. Um, that becomes a um, that becomes a condition. Like so, they are like on fire. So you know maybe they take like you know maybe they take four points of stress and they have a D four condition. They are on fire. And that's something that you can very easily um, craft uh, as a power for a monster and. Because the list of bonuses isn't really high, it's something you could do, you know, on the fly. Maybe they have a bad role. Maybe they critically fumble or something like that, and you decide, oh, they're exploring this uh, uh, this uh, this cave. Well, actually, this, this is trapped, and so I'm going to have a poison needle because of this. And and so, what's the poison needle? Well, let's give them a D6 extra die, and um, if. Uh, you know, if, if they uh, if they get hit with it, then they take some damage and they get a condition that they're poisoned. And then the condition just gets invoked anytime it's appropriate for the poison to make life more difficult for the uh, um, uh, for the for the player character. Um, so uh, so so monster design, um, threat design, uh, sort of like you know, all of that sort of uh, game master work. Uh, I really wanted to make it as, as simple as possible so GMs can focus on the thing they really want to do, which is, you know, tell stories. Um, in fact, in, in, in the fifth engine, you know, we call them game makers, not game masters, because that's really what they're doing. They're, you know, they're making the game, they're making the story, and then giving the players room to feel like big damn heroes. Now, with that said, I I do want to give my congrats on how well the Kickstarter has gone. Um, what are you looking at as? I'm in five hours. I was very happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are you looking at as far as a page count goes? Uh, th this is a zine, so it's going to be about thirty pages. That's the um, that's the entire um, uh, fifth engine uh, rule set, and um, and then. Uh, uh, setting, which is going to be um, a, uh, a history in the form of like an oral uh, history of the planet, uh, rules for different races, uh, regions, and the sort of um, challenges that are endemic in each one of those regions. Um, obviously, we've got a bad guy. Um, so uh, the, um, uh, the characters... In, begin in this setting um, in an age where the world is dying. Um, people waged war against the Grey Ark, the Sorcerer Kings, and um, you know, in their folly and hubris, uh, as like all of the great superpowers do, um, they tried to draw power directly from the Shen Bridge, which linked Materia to the source of Shen, and they shattered it, and that became that became the age of stars. Because before, all the light in the planet came from the Shen Bridge, and it was bright, and it was basically sunny out all the time. Well, when the Shen Bridge broke, all of the um, uh, you know, basically the fragments of Shen scattered across the sky. So now the whole world is lit in twilight. And it is a continual twilight. So there's never, uh, you know, there's no sun, there's no moon. All of the light in the world is just these twinkling stars. And 
because they're basically chunks of shin, um, that power is dissipating. Mm -hmm. uh, so the um, so the sky is getting darker, the world is getting weaker and colder, and the way that people will do, um, there's still some guy out there that is still trying to like you know grab all the power he can, and that's the Iron Khan. Uh, the Iron Khan was a Earth human who crossed over, um, as the name suggests, a, um, a, a, a Mongolian warlord who became the general for the uh, the sorcerer kings. And after their downfall, he pulled what he remnants of their empire together that he could. And one of the things that he found was all of this crazy. Um, alchemical and um, a magical apparatus that the sorcerer kings were using, and one of the big uh, biggest ones was the Shenjin. This is a basically a battery for Shen. You stick one of these things on on a dragon line, and it will slowly absorb Shen uh, for later use. And essentially, it becomes a magical battery that the Iron Khan uses to develop the Shen battlers. And this is where this becomes the source of his power. Um, so the tricky thing with Shen battlers is you have to have a really powerful personal Shen. There aren't a whole lot of people in the world that have that. People that can actually pilot these things are rare until humans start showing up. And when humans from Earth start showing up, the reason why Materia is pulling them over is because they, we, our world, is dripping with Shen. And since there's no direct way for Materia to pull Shen from the Earth, the, the, the Shen bridge is gone, um, it can pull humans through. So um, there is a kind of Earth human um, that has uh, very distinctive marks on their body. And um, uh, this is known as stigmata on materia. And the stigma are Earth humans who have a very easy connection with Shen. They can, um, uh, you know, they almost bleed Shen. Like, and these, so these are people that are just, you know, full of life. They're vivacious. They just like, you know, the people that you see and just like, wow, they're just bursting with life. That's literally true. Because their Shen is just sort of like radiating from them. And Materia feels that. And literally the planet's hunger pulls these people from Earth onto Materia. So hum like the, the, the special ability of humans is they have an affinity with magic. Because um, their stigmata gives them a closer connection to Shen. And they have more of it. Um, this can be problematic if they go to an area that's blighted, that has basically had its shen ripped from it, um, the land is hungry, and it will actually start sucking down, uh, you know, sucking the, uh, uh, the person's shen away from them. Um, some magical creatures uh, have just been, like, worse than killed. Uh, the dragons are immortal, so they can't die, but they're starving. So if you can imagine a vampire who is locked in a box, unable to die, but unable to feed, and like the kind of the level of madness that they would go through, that's what the dragons are experiencing. They don't actually call them dragons when they go insane. They become ravagers, and they just are engines of destruction. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, I'm trying to remember where uh, where we started. Yeah, this you you ended up go, you ended up going completely off the rails. So, uh, ask your question again, and I will uh, I'll yeah. get us back on track. Um, I was I was asking about a page count, and then you just then you yes, <laughs> you're asking a page count, and then I go into the uh the, the whole thing. Yeah, so um uh yeah, so um uh, rule set that actually is about um uh like four to six pages. So you know, the, um, uh, the, I, I try and keep the you know the rule descriptions tight mm -hmm. and easy to follow. Um, character creation archetypes. There's a dozen anime archetypes, each coming from favorite character types from anime and manga. 
um, uh, races or peoples, as I like to call them, um, uh, and then a section for custom powers, talents, and tools. And then it's uh, it's setting information, locations, um, uh, you know, important people, uh, story plots and ideas, uh, and of course rules for creating um, the Shen battlers. So I figure like about thirty pages, mm -hmm. maybe uh, you know maybe maybe thirty five on the outside, um, but uh, but you know not a um, you know. Not not a big book, just just packed with um, with useful stuff. Yeah, I can get I can get that. And as far as a release window, not a date per se, but a ballpark. Yeah. What would you be shooting for? Very shortly after uh, after funding, most of the layout is done right now, and um, uh, you know I, I you know I anticipate um, uh, uh, fulfillment coming. Um, uh, well, we uh, the Kickstarter ends um, March is it March third. Let me just check March fifth. So Tuesday, March fifth is the last day, and um, and then we'll um, uh, I I anticipate fulfillment um, end of March. Mm -hmm. oh. um, yeah, because uh, uh, you know the, the you know most, you know the writing portion is done. Really, it's just it, it, it uh, and my art, you know, pieces are assembled. So, um, yeah, really it's just uh, a question of, um, you know, finishing the layout. Mm -hmm. And from what I, and I, I will certainly be keeping an eye on it. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And, I'm glad to bask in the madness. Yeah, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around what? here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, you know, we um, uh, we this um, uh, this Kickstarter is funded, and um, you know, uh, we'll be out by March. And uh, we are also still working on um, our big. Uh, book release for uh, Mecha versus Kaiju, which is going to be probably like a you know, 250 page plus um, a book that that really is a detailed system um, uh, with lots of options and um, uh, also lots of like GM information because that's something as a GM I want to make things easy for the game makers so that they are free to come up with their ideas. And so the, the, the full Mecha vs. Kaiju book is still in um, uh, in development uh, on our Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash Mecha vs. Kaiju. And, um, uh, and you can easily find the Kickstarter uh, just by going to uh, Mecha vs. Kaiju.com slash Kickstarter. It'll take you right to our, um, right to our campaign. And with, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on to the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs> <laughs>